So now that we've explored production possibility frontier and looked at opportunity costs, we can now talk about comparative advantage in trades and when it's good for a nation, for a firm, for whoever to specialize in trade. So let's say, for instance, you and your neighbor have a limited time to pick apples and or cherries. You have to choose a combination of the two or choose to focus on one or the other. So this table below shows the amount of each fruit that you could pick by devoting all your time to that fruit. So you could, if you devoted all your time to picking apples, pick 20 apples and again get zero cherries. If you devoted all your time to picking cherries, you could pick 20 cherries and zero apples. Now your neighbor is better at fruit picking than you. They can pick 30 pounds of apples if they specialize in apples, or they could pick 60 pounds of cherries if they focus in cherries. So your production possibility frontier curve can be represented by the figure on the left. If you focus on apples, you can pick 20 apples and zero cherries. And if you pick 20 cherries, you'll pick zero apples. So then the line connecting those two is your production possibility frontier. Now your neighbors look different because they can pick more than you can. So if they focus on apples, they'd pick 30 apples and zero cherries. And if they focus on cherries, they'd pick 60 cherries and zero apples. So they have a di that production possibility frontier that connects those two points. So now what if you and your neighbor decided to specialize and focus on picking one of those and then trade with each other? Remember, trade is the act of buying and selling. In this example, it'll be trading cherries for apples, but in the real world, we use cash, we use money to facilitate exchange between those just to make it easier. So now, could your neighbor benefit from trade? She's better at picking both apples and cherries than you are. In fact, both of you can benefit from trade if you specialize what you're relatively good at, so what you're better at compared to them. And for this, we'll need to use opportunity cost. So let's look at an example of where you and your neighbor don't trade and you both pick a combination of apples and cherries. So if you don't trade with your neighbor, let's say you consume 8 pounds of apples and 12 pounds of cherries per week. That's going to be point A in your production possibility frontier on the left. When your neighbor doesn't trade with you, she picks and consumes 9 pounds of apples and 42 pounds of cherries per week. So that'll be point C on the production possibility frontier. But now let's see what happens when you and your neighbor specialize and then trade. So if you specialize in picking apples, you can pick 20 apples and zero cherries. If your neighbor specializes in picking cherries, she can pick 60 pounds of cherries and zero apples. So now you both specialize, and then you can now trade some of your apples for cherries and vice versa. So if you trade 10 pounds of your apples for 15 pounds of your neighbor's cherries, you will be able to consume 10 pounds of apples and 15 pounds of cherries. That's going to be point B in panel A, so the figure on the left above. If you notice that, looking at that, 10 and 15 is outside of your production possibility frontier. So by specializing in trading, you've made yourself better off. Remember, you're not able to produce to the right of that production possibility frontier. You can only produce on that line or to the left of it. So by trading, you've now made yourself better off than you ever could by just um, you know, not engaging in trade and focusing on picking apples and cherries yourself. Now that result shouldn't be too surprising because your neighbor can pick more cherries and apples than you. They, they're better at picking both. But let's look what happens to your neighbor when she engages in trade with you after specializing. Your neighbor can now consume 10 pounds of apples because of the trade and 45 pounds of cherries, the 65 minus the 15 she traded you. So that's figure D, or point D, and figure B, so on the right. You and your neighbor are both made better off. Point D is again to the right, outside of her production possibility frontier. So even though she is better able to pick both apples and cherries than you, by specializing one and trading with you, she is also made better off. So both of you have been made better off by engaging in trade. So even though your neighbor could produce more of either fruit than you could, your neighbor still benefits from trade. This is incredibly important. And this highlights the gains that we have from specializing and then engaging in trade. And here we see the results in a table form instead of on the graph. So if you produce and consume without trade, you can consume eight apples and 12 cherries. Your neighbor can produce nine apples 
and 42 cherries. So now your production with trade, if you focus solely on, on producing one good, you can pr um, produce 20 pounds of apples and your neighbor 60 pounds of cherries. But your consumption with trade, once you engage in that trade, be 10 pounds of apples for 15 pounds of cherries, you can now consume 10 pounds of apples and 15 pounds of cherries. And your neighbor can consume 10 pounds of apples and 45 pounds of cherries. So the gains from trade, how much better off you've made yourself from this trade, you've um, gained two additional pounds of apples for you to consume and three additional pounds of cherries for you to consume. So that's how much better off you've made yourself. Your neighbor has almost made themselves as well off. She's made herself better off by getting one more pound of apples and three more pounds of cherries. So now what's going on here? How could both of you make yourselves better off through trade when your neighbor was so much better at picking fruit than you? Economists say that your neighbor had an absolute advantage in both apple picking and cherry picking. But in fact, you had a comparative advantage in pick picking apples. So absolute advantage. That's the ability of an individual, a firm, or a country to produce more of a good or service than their competitors using the same amount of resources. So you could pick 20 pounds of apples, she could pick 30 pounds of apples. Your neighbor had the absolute advantage in picking apples. Now comparative advantage, this is different. Comparative advantage is the ability of a firm, an individual, or a country to produce the good or service at a lower opportunity cost than competitors. So when you're producing apples, you're doing so at a lower opportunity cost than your neighbor in this case, because she's giving up more cherries in order to pick those apples. That's why you're able to gain from trade, because you had different opportunity costs. Now let's look at this at a table so we can really help us visualize this and understand it. So the opportunity cost of picking one pound of apples. For you, you're giving up one pound of cherries. Again, because you could pick either 20 pounds of apples or 20 pounds of cherries. Now for your neighbor, the opportunity cost of picking one pound of apples is two pounds of cherries. Remember, because she can pick 30 pounds of apples or 60 pounds of cherries. So in order to produce one pound of apples, she's giving up more cherries than you are. It makes you relatively better at producing those, you know, at a relatively lower cost compared to her cost. Now on the other hand, the opportunity cost of picking one pound of cherries. For you, again, that's going to be one pound of apples. But for your neighbor, She's only going to have to give up 0.5 pounds of apples. So she's relatively better at producing apples than you are. So the basis for trade and whether a trade can take place and whether it's beneficial for both parties is based on comparative advantage, not absolute advantage. Individuals, firms, and countries are better off if they specialize in producing goods and services for which they have a comparative advantage in and obtain the other goods and services they need by trading instead of trying to produce them themselves. Originally, economists thought absolute advantage was what determined trade, but they were puzzled by seeing countries that were far less productive than others producing and engaging in trade. They wondered why it was worth it, because they didn't yet understand opportunity costs like we're understanding it now. So now let's make another connection with a real world example. So comparative advantage in housework. So people living together, they have to divide up household chores. They need to figure out a way to do that. Obviously, there's tons of different ways to do that. But basic concepts like comparative advantage can provide a useful insight into the division of labor. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to divide up labor to do it in the most efficient way possible. Well, they can choose efficiency. They could choose other methods. Maybe one enjoys one more than the other. But let's just look at efficiency for this example. So suppose that Jack is faster than Jill at both cooking and laundry. So Jack has an absolute advantage in both cooking and laundry. But let's say, for sake of example, Jack is much faster at preparing tasty meals, while Jack is only a little faster at doing laundry. So Jack's comparative advantage is going to be in cooking. So to cook a tasty meal, he gives up the opportunity cost to perform less laundry than Jill. So he should specialize in producing the tasty meals, while Jill specializes in the laundry. Again, she ends up with a lower opportunity cost of producing laundry. Now let's turn to the market system. Again, in Econ 102, this is something you'll go into much more in-depth looking at, but it's still important to cover in principles and macro so we can understand what's going on in the market. 
So a market is just a group of buyers and sellers of a good or service, and the institutional arrangement by which they come together to trade. So there's two key groups that participate in the modern economy. There's the consumer side, there's households and individuals, and they provide the factors of production. So labor, capital, natural resources, and other inputs into good or goods and services. And households receive payments for these factors by selling them to firms. So if you think about it, when you work for an employer, you sell them your labor. Now firms, they supply goods and services to product markets. So households, these individuals, buy these products from the firm. So now a free market is a market in which there's few government restrictions on how a good or service can be produced or sold or how a factor of production can be employed. The decision making is left up to individuals and firms within the market rather than government actors. Now countries that come closest to the free market benchmark have traditionally been more successful than those centrally planned economies in providing their people with rising living standards over a long period of time. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that go into this. Um, by encouraging, by rewarding people for providing goods and services that consumers need, you're, you end up encouraging them to do that because you provide them their rewards. Their own self-interest helps them meet others' needs. Um, it also allows for more experimentation. So we have entrepreneurs trying to come up with new and different ways to combine resources, to make products, to offer new products that people didn't have in the past. Through this experimentation, we reward successes and we punish failures through the profit and loss mechanism. So if you meet consumer needs, if you're doing a good job selling a product, you're going to earn a profit. Not only does that encourage you to keep making those goods and services, but it encourages other firms to copy you. We see successful products being copied by other firms all the time. Conversely, the loss mechanism is a punishment to firms for not providing the products that meet consumer needs at a low enough price. And what loss does is encourages firms to move those resources to products that do meet consumer needs or for that firm to go out of business and another better run firm that knows how to meet consumer needs to, um, to use those resources to continue meeting consumer needs so they can profit. Now this basic concept of profit and loss and the role of entrepreneurs in improving the economy isn't new. In fact, Adam Smith argued for free markets and described how the market works in his 1776 book, An Inquiry into the Causes of the Wealth of Nations. This was the first book of economics um, and really spun it off as its own field rather than as a small subset that a few philosophers talked about every hundred years or so. Now we'll briefly touch on the role of prices in a market economy. In a market economy where you're not having a central planner directing how to use um, resources, how to make products, prices are what serve to, um, to signify to firms and to uh, consumers what to do. They serve as both a signal and an incentive. So prices result from the market process. Firms can, they have their own leeway to choose prices but they must be at or near the market price. And over time, they're encouraged to move towards the equilibrium price, which we'll talk about later. They're not freely chosen or forced on consumers. In fact, they're, um, over time, firms cannot be successful by ignoring what consumers want. Prices aggregate and transmit economic knowledge. Now, what I mean by that is every good and service or every good or resource out there has alternate uses. It can be used in the production of numerous goods. So what prices do is they show how much something is worth to all the different market participants. Now if, if a resource or if a good is worth a lot to someone, they will build up the price. They'll be willing to pay more and more money for it. This signals to others that there are higher valued uses for those products. So they will economize or they will use less or they'll choose to use other inputs or other goods in their production process, saving it for where those goods have the highest valued usage. So far, this is the most efficient way we've come up with to conserve resources for those who value them the most. Prices are not perfect. This is important to remember. So we talk about how great the market is and the market mechanism is fantastic. Of course, as an economist, I choose to study, so obviously I'm going to love it, but I might be a little biased. However, prices aren't perfect. We often lack complete knowledge. Knowledge is very difficult, very time-consuming, very expensive to obtain, and it's a long process. 
to, to discover knowledge. So prices will change as we discover new knowledge and we act upon this knowledge. They re prices reflect all the knowledge that we've, um, that we've discovered and we've been able to act upon so far, but there's always new information to discover, whether it's new ways of producing a good, um, new consumer needs, or new way to meet old consumer needs. Now, it's not immediately obvious that markets are going to do better than centrally planned systems for satisfying human desires. A lot of people who dislike markets historically have said, look at all these entrepreneurs, look at all these different businesses doing things different way. Look how efficient it is to let this entrepreneur go out there and do something stupid and fail. That's a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of heartache and stress for the people involved. We know the best way to do it. We're smart. Why don't we just tell these firms what to produce and how to produce it? So much more efficient and waste so much less time. However, there are serious problems with that. Another critique is that individuals are acting in their own self-interest. When they're acting in their own self-interest, they're not taking into consideration the needs of others. And if they do take into consideration others' needs, others' needs don't rate as highly as their own needs. While this is true, markets with flexible prices allow the collective actions of households and firms to signal to the relative worth of goods or services, like I mentioned on the previous slide. So in this way, the invisible hands, the invisible hand, which is what Adam Smith called the market mechanism, which seems to as if there's a central planner moving the market towards equilibrium. This allows individuals' responses to collectively add up satisfying the wants of consumers. Now it's important for a market system to be designed properly, to have the proper protections to ensure that producers and firms are successful by meeting consumer needs. If they can get away with not providing products that meet consumer needs, if there's something preventing competition, from forcing them to offer lower prices or higher quality goods, then markets may not result in the best outcome. So the key is making sure to align incentives so that firms and producers, that their self-interest aligns with consumer self-interest. So while government may not um, be important in actually determining what resources to use or how to use them, in a market economy, the, a sound legal system is incredibly important to ensuring the market to function successfully. So think of the government as like the referees, making sure that all the trades that take place are legal, are ethical, and there's no problems with them. They're setting the rules of the game, and then they're letting firms and consumers play the game. One of the most important roles is the protection of private property. So if criminals can take your wages or your profits, household and firms have little incentive to work hard. And rather than putting, reinvesting their money into becoming more productive, so maybe spending money on education, spending money on themselves for like their wants or needs, or firms reinvesting their profits to become more productive, what little money they do spend, they'll spend on defending their money to make sure no one steals it from them. While that may make them better off by being able to keeping some of their money, overall makes the economy worse off because we're wasting money on just protecting it when if we had the strong protection of private property, individuals could be helping to grow the economy. They can make a high, better profit for themselves and make all society better off. Also, government provides the enforcement of contracts and property rights. In order for con transactions across time to occur, both parties need to be confident that the other side of the transaction is going to uphold their end of the bargain. Without that, people will be unwilling or unable to engage in long-term transactions. So you won't be able to borrow to buy a house or borrow to buy a car. An independent court system is critical for this. So this um, judiciary that provides legal protections that enforces contracts is incredibly important if we want to have a successful market economy. And to conclude the section, I'll briefly touch upon the role of entrepreneurship. An entrepreneur is someone who operates a business, brings together factors of production, so labor, capital, and natural resources, to produce goods or services. Entrepreneur's role is to find a need that's not being met, or to find a better way, a cheaper way, a more efficient way to meet consumer needs.
the best entrepreneurs create products that consumers never knew they wanted. So this is a great quote from Henry Ford that I really enjoy. He said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. He didn't look at what consumers wanted. He looked to find a new way to transport people and a quicker way to transport people. Now, at the time that he was you know, owning and operating Ford, there were other automobile companies. But what he did was combine the resources in a more efficient way. He introduced the assembly line, which increased their productivity substantially above their competitors. They provided a much cheaper car, so more people were able to afford to buy cars. Entrepreneurs, through this way, make a vital contribution for economic growth. They help discover new opportunities, new ways to provide consumers with the products they, they need. And they often take considerable personal risk and sacrifice. I will be going too in-depth into entrepreneurs in this class, um, but it's very important when you talk about how markets operate and how they provide consumers, how they meet consumer needs, that you talk about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs and their vital role in the economy.